Good morning, good morning, Catch on Fire Ministry. I hope each and every one of y'all had a blessed weekend, and it was marvelous hot outside. <laughs> We're going into our welcome prayer. Would you everyone stand, please, and let's pray. Good morning, God. Gracious God. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Father. Father, there will be done, Father. Just keep us uplifted, Father. We are small of nimbles, Father, but we're going to gather in your house and praise your name, Father God. I thank you for the week, Father God. I thank you for the, the um, each and every, every morning rise, Father. I thank you for it. Father God, I thank you for the family of this church, Father. This church family, Father, that we can get together and praise your name and peace and love and joy. And I thank you, Father. Father, God, continue to watch each and every one that's in this home house today. The ones outside, Father, watch over them also, Father. So we got so many going on, going on home, Father God. Father God, the ones here, Father God, just want to say thank you. Keep strengthening us. Keep the power of the name of your glory over us, Father God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going into our uh, praise and worship with our kids.
music for the praise of worship. And then we're going to uh, praise and worship with the adults. Please come forward.
so many wonderful things about Jesus. Yes, it is. Praise the Lord. Yeah, Lord. Catch up five minutes. Who we are is being read by Miss Tiffany Stewart. That the work, the Apostle Paul, Paul stated that the work of, of Christian church is built up by the body of Christ so that many may, so all that, all may become mature Christians. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Catch on Fire Ministries is committed to in fulfilling the scripture. Our mission is to draw people to Christ and enable them to continually grow into being like Christ. Catch on Fire Ministries is composed of disciples and led by disciples. Catch on Fire Ministries is affiliated of Church of God, of Prophecy, Buckley, St. Kitts. This church falls under the leadership of Bishop Lionel Bill. Worship time, Sundays, 9.30, Sunday morning worship. Wednesday, 6.30, Discipleship Class Fellowship. Saturdays at 11 a.m., Praise and Worship Team Practice. visitors. We have no visitors, but it's okay. One day we're going to have a full house. It don't matter. God said we're one to two three together. We will praise his name. So each and every last one of y'all that walk and touch on five ministry, just go out and tell somebody. And praise the Lord. And I welcome you all. Now we're going into our offering with Miss Tiffany's. Offering. Prayer. Thank those who can give. Thank those who can give in Jesus' name. Let's tear down state and stronghold. And let's build Jesus' kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Ways to give online, catch on fire ministries.org. Sell CFFM 1013, protonmail.com. Offering scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided into your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus' name. And we will have a scripture reading from Miss Tiffany Stewart. Scripture reading, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard. And to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry but others out of the goodwill. The latter do, do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach, Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely su supposing that they come, can stare up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, 
and I will continue to rejoice. For I am, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live in Christ and to die in gain. If I am to go on the living in a body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet that shall I. I am torn between the two, and I des desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith. So, that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound, abound. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's prayer time. Would you each and every one to come for our prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and God, we just want to lift up holy hands and praise you. The song says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. It's grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace that will lead us on. Lord, we want to thank you for another day's journey. We want to thank you for your anointing. We want to thank you for your presence. We want to thank you because you said you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. To all the changing scenes of life, we ask your presence to be with us always, God. Moses said, if your presence don't go, I'm not going, God. Lord, healing from the crown of the head to the sole of our feet, we ask you, God, every in our bodies to function as you want it to in the name of Jesus. We ask for your presence, say God, all over us. We send your angels as we travel these highways. Lord, protect us. Keep us, God. Pour your presence into us. Let these children be okay. Be with them all through the summer. We bless you. We love you. And we praise you. Now we're going into the sermon of the induction of the song of the sermon.
speaking today and to, to live is Christ. And Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 26, we just read. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that your word will go forth with power. We pray that you will touch lives. I pray that you will be all, that it will be none of me and all of you. In your name, Jesus, we ask for your presence and your anointing to fill this house, dear God, so that everyone here and those who may listen on the internet will come to know you more. I might come to know you for the very first time, but so that they may know you in the beauty of holiness. We thank you for the effort, for the excellence, the commitment to excellence that has been shown here on a weekly and on, on a daily basis. We thank you for everything in your name. Amen. So we're talking, Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. And uh, Philip, who was king of Macedonia, um, he did a lot of work on this city. And after he did that work, he named it after himself, um, Philippi. That's how he got that name. And he went to war with Mark Antony. We might know Mark Antony um, because he was famous for being with Cleopatra, the, uh, the African queen. And so he was defeated by Philip and uh, uh, rather Caesar Augustus. And he raised the status of the city to a colony. As a colony of Rome, they supposedly had all the privileges of being as though they were in, in Italy. And they did not have to pay taxes, which was a big deal for them. As we know, the Jews resented the Roman rule greatly because they had to pay so much in taxes. And Philippi was located on the Via Ignatia. This was a major east-west road. Um, which ran from Rome all the way to the lands of the east. Uh, it's like saying Clarksville is located on I-24, and I-24 you know, runs all the way up, and so the, all the way down to Nashville. We could keep going to Memphis, or we could go all the way up to Chicago. So Philippi was a center of commerce, well located, and it was wealthy, you know. And Paul receive a vision to go down to Philippi. He was the first to take the gospel deal. At that time, he was in a city called Troas that is now located in Turkey. You can still go there and visit it. And this was a crucial occurrence because this was the first time that the gospel was being taken into Europe. This was the beginning of, this was the very first church that was founded on European soil, this church in Philippi. And we still sing about it today. We have a hymn that says, we have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. And that's what they're referring to when Paul had this vision to go down to Philippi. And Paul didn't go by himself. He took Silas, he took Luke, he took Timothy. And they got on a boat and they traveled and then they walked into. And uh, this four of them were able to spend two months in Philippi. No, they got up and they went just based on Paul seeing a vision. Not knowing where they were going or how they were going to make it. And the very first person they met was Lydia, a seller of purple. And she was a God-fearer. That means she wasn't Jewish, but she wanted to know more about God. So she had joined the temple. She was a Gentile who was trying to know God. And so God led them to her, and she invited them into her home. Now Lydia, as a seller of purple, um, only kings and rulers wore purple. It's like saying she was selling diamonds. She was extremely wealthy. So it was easy for her to take these four people who had just shown up, nowhere to go. But they told her what she needed to know, what she had been looking for. She found a man, Christ Jesus. She got rid of all of her insecurities. And so God, because they obeyed God, they got to stay in one of the richest places that they would probably ever get a chance to stay. As they were staying with Lydia, who was selling purple. You know, um, so, but during that time in Philippi, Paul and Silas winded up in prison. 
unjustly as usual. And when God, they didn't start to complain and say, what did I do wrong? Why am I here? They decided to praise God. And at midnight, while they were just being beat, beaten, they were still in chains, God shook the prison and didn't just release them, but release everybody who was in jail. And that's what can happen when you praise God. Not just us going to be released from the bondage of Satan, but everybody who's around us will get to know who Jesus is. And so the jailer, he was about to kill himself because for a Roman to be in charge of a jail and then all of the prisons have gone free. You might as well kill yourself before the Jews, the rest of the Romans get to kill you. And so he came to know Jesus. But Paul and Silas were still thrown out of Philippi. And they left Timothy behind, Luke and Timothy, and they went on to Thessalonica. When Paul wrote this letter, he says he was in prison. He was in military custody, and we believe that it was Rome because he refers to Caesar's household. It's like, say, the person's referring to the president household. I mean, he got to be in Washington. I can't be talking about Biden, and I'm here in Clarksville. So when he refers to Caesar's household, he had to be in Rome. And he was in prison in Rome twice. This was the very first time that he was in prison. And this is the prison imprisonment that is referred to at the end of the book of Acts. We must understand that Acts wasn't written. And they didn't write the Bible to say how wonderful they are. When Luke finished writing Acts, he left Paul in prison. He didn't bring him out and say, oh, he was such a glorious person, etc. It was all about Jesus and the presence of the Holy Ghost. And when Paul was in prison, he didn't waste time. This time he wrote four letters, and they're normally referred to as the prison epistles. Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Of these, Philippians was written at the last when he was nearing the end of time. Uh, the end of his imprisonment in Rome. And he wrote it because jail in those days is different from prison here. Here in America and in my country, if you go to prison, they'll feed you. If you went to prison those days, they did not feed you. Somebody better keep you alive. You could starve for all the Roman Empire kid. So the... The people, the church at Philippi was sending food and money so that Paul could stay alive and that he could keep going and he would not be disheartened. In the entire New Testament, there are only three books in which the Apostle Paul is not threatening people and telling them how badly behaved they are and how he's going to have to come and put them in order. And all of these were located in Macedonia, Philippians, Thessalonians, and Philemon. And this, let, this letter to Philippians is a letter of love and joy. He's just loving on them. And this shows an example of how a mature church behaves. You know, they weren't falling apart because... Paul was in prison and things had gone wrong with him. They weren't losing their faith and say, he must have done something wrong. God can't be with him. They were still serving and they were still supporting him because they knew that he was truly a man of God. You know, and they had money. They were wealthy. They weren't, you know, I, we have a say in my country, selfishness does not prosper. If you only care about yourself and your family and you ain't have no money for anybody else, you will find that you struggle. The Bible says that those who scatter tend to do well. And those who hold on thinking that they can only care about themselves tend to come to naught. They go into poverty. So it's important that we learn to give like how this church was given and give to those in need. And here we have Paul saying, what has happened to me has truly served to advance the gospel. Here is Paul in chains. They had seen that when things went wrong with him in Philippi, the prison doors got open by the power of God as they praised God. They had seen 
the power of God, deliver God, um, um, Paul out of extreme difficulty. And uh, they were wondering why it wasn't happening again. You know, uh, the P Pastor Paul was making it clear that they weren't supposed to get down. They were supposed to realize that it doesn't matter what. As he said to the Romans, all things work together for good for them who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And at times it seems like this. You know, the song says, and I think by now you would have shown up and delivered me. You know, and what it seems like we are going through is the worst possible thing that could happen at, at, uh, to us. But when we look back, we are amazed at how God brings us through. This time last year, June, uh, I had had a contract terminated. I was supposed to work until June 30th. And they decided they were going to terminate it on June 6th. You know, that was, and they gave me like two weeks notice when they were supposed to give me at least 30 days. And I was really down. You know, I had already looked around this church and I'd say, okay, I'll keep the keyboard, I'll give away the chairs. I had already shut down the church in my spirit and in my mind. I was so sad because Aisha was studying for the bar and I didn't want to disturb her because I was going to go to Chicago by my older daughter, you know, because she had a four-bedroom condo and I knew that I would always be welcome there. And I, you know, and I was, there weren't many people, if anybody was coming yet, because I don't think that Aunt Cathy and them started coming till, towards the end of June. It was a very sad month for me, I'm telling you. But what happened to me, that same week, I got a job, and they were only advertising that job for that week. If I hadn't been unemployed, I would not have gotten that job that I got that week. They had to, God had to get me out of that June 30th contract. And I can tell you in 20 years, I haven't had this good a job. Uh, this is where I feel God really wanted me to go. So it's going to look like it's not working right. But God's got us. It's just like how Paul could say that I am the prisoner of the Lord. It's not Rome that has me here. It's God who has me here. You know, and here he, Paul is using the Greek word prokop. Which means when the army is on the move, when they not when they're in the camp waiting, they have taken up their sword and shield and they're getting ready to go into battle. And that's what Paul says he's doing. Because he saw himself as a general in the army of the Lord. And he's advancing the cause of Jesus Christ. And he has come to Rome. He's always been trying to get to Rome. He wrote letters to Rome. He he wrote to Corinth and he said, I'm going to come to Rome. I'm ready to preach. Because he said Rome was the premier city in the Roman Empire. And if he could change them for Christ, it's like saying if New York, if, you, if the primary population in New York started worshipping, it would change the world. Because everybody comes to New York. So he's not lamenting that he's there. He wanted to go to preach. He thought he would have a church and be raised in the dead as he had done and started a church. Instead, he's a prisoner. He can't leave. He can't go. But he said, I'm here because God wants me to be. I don't know what it means. I and mean, we must have the same attitude as Christians. In all the changing scenes of life, we have to praise God. Sickness may come. He never said that it's going to be easy. He just said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm always going to be there with you. I don't care what you're going through. Sometimes God delivers us from the storm. Sometimes he keeps us safe in the middle of the storm. 
form. It's so that others could see how we live for him. That's what it's about. I wear the only Jesus that a lot of people are going to see. They're not going to come here. And unless we live for him and praise him in the midst of the circumstances, they won't know who Jesus is. And that's exactly what Paul was doing. He was giving God the praise and presenting Jesus to a lost and dying world. He said, the whole palace God knows that I am in chains for Christ. You know, Paul got the unfairly. He was in the temple worshiping, minding his own business, and the Jews came for him to kill him. The Romans had to rescue him. When you read the episode in Acts, you could see that the soldiers rushed in, circled him, took him to prison, and then they were told that some wicked Jews had said they're not going to eat until they finish, until they kill Paul. And so the commander said, take him out of here. Take him out of here in the dark so that they couldn't interfere. Get horses and ride out of here with Paul. That's how Paul stayed alive. And they took him down to Caesarea where um, Felix was the governor. And there he had escaped Jerusalem. They weren't satisfied. The high priest himself, Annas, came with a crowd to say, we need to kill him. They had, weren't giving up. The devil doesn't change his mind about killing us. As long as we are on God's side, he's coming to kill. He's not praying. The, Jesus said he came to kill, steal, and destroy. So we're not supposed to be surprised. We're not supposed to get down. We're just supposed to, the Bible says, count it all joy. Thank you, Lord, that I'm here willing and worthy. That people thinking of the devil thinking of, of me to be trying to kill me. And thank you, Lord, that I'm here worthy worshiping you. I'm walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And so he went before Felix and Felix was willing to give him up. But Paul didn't give in and say, oh, I'm outnumbered and I'm outranked. He told Felix, I'm a Roman citizen. I have a right to appear before Caesar. I appeal to Caesar. No matter what, we must never cooperate with the enemy in Jesus' name. We must never give in and say, oh, they're, they're more than us. As long as God is with us, we are the majority. If we open our eyes, we'll see angels all around taking care of us in Jesus' name. We've been made more than conquerors. No weapon for against us can never prosper in Jesus name and the tongues that rise up against us we will condemn them in Jesus name the lies that they're spreading we are going to say that's not true that's not who I am in the name of Jesus I am a child of the most high God I've been made more than conquerors I'm walking in victory in the name of Jesus and Felix was an awful person. So he kept caught Paul in prison for two long years just to curry favor with the Jews, as we would say. Because the Jews, didn't, and he thought they were more important than Paul. But you got to be careful when you go up against the most high God. In those two years, Felix lost his job as governor of Caesarea. He was moved out. God going to move out whoever he needs to move us, to clear the way for us to do God's will. It's, you know, I've seen a lot of things that has made me wonder sometimes because I never fail to pray the Bible. And the Bible says the hole that they're digging for you, they're the ones going to fall into it. And I remind God that I don't like David. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies try triumph over me. Let them know that Jesus is real. That God that they're serving, that idol that they're worshiping, it ain't got no ears, ain't got no eyes, can't do nothing for them. But I walk in victory. And so Paul was here. Festus came and Felix went out in disgrace. 
the emperor knew that Felix wasn't doing his job and told him to get lost because he decided to just hold on to Paul because he could. So Festus, who succeeded Felix, did send Paul to Rome. <clears throat> and here was Paul being looked after by the imperial guard of Rome. Caesar Augustus is who set up these palace guards. He started out with 10,000 soldiers that he handpicked, the best of the best. And initially they would serve for 12 years. By the time Paul came around, they were serving for 16 years. And when I said they were the best, they were like the army rangers, the navy seals, the secret service. These were the imperial guards who were looking after Paul. And so while he was awaiting trial, he was in the custody of these guards. You know, he had to come up with his own housing, pay his own rent. This is a weird jail. You know, you got to find your way to live and your way to eat. Rome wasn't wasting any money on you. But one thing that they did, he was chained by the wrist to the soldier who was guarding him. He was never, ever free. And so every four hours they would change the guard and another person would attach themselves to Paul. So he couldn't just want. But what that meant is whether they wanted to or not, they had to hear Paul speak about Jesus. And he was witnessing to them. That's why he said the whole palace guard knows about Jesus. History is recorded, it's documented that Christianity spread throughout the, these um, soldiers of Rome. They said they were so surprised when they found Christians as part of these elite. But it's because Paul went there as a prisoner. And had he not gone there as a prisoner, they would have never spoken to him. A poor homeless Jew wandering to Rome, they would have passed him straight. But these the most important soldiers in the Roman Empire were being told about Jesus by Paul. And they were listening to him. They didn't just say, oh, this is another guilty person want to say he's innocent. Because everybody, a lot of people in jail said they're innocent. Most everybody on the TV says so. <laughs> you know, I, I remember watching this movie where the warden said he don't know when they're going to ever lock up some guilty person. Because everybody in here says they're innocent. You know, um, I'm sure there are innocent people there. Because um, I've seen how justice goes, especially when we are people of color. You know, that they, how quick they are to give us the, the heaviest and the worst sentence. But there are others who are not, you know. Um, it was God who ordered Paul's step and took him there. It doesn't matter our circumstances. He didn't say the road would be easy. But we lift up holy hands and we give God all the honor and the praise because he has done great things. You know, it doesn't matter what we go through because God has made such a difference in our lives. When we look back at where we've come from, as to where we're going and where we are today, had it not been for the Lord, what would Israel say? Had it not been for God at our side, you know, we hear about John Bunyan. He wrote, he was preaching in the streets of Bedford. And just like in Jesus' time, a lot of time the people who are in charge ain't in nothing with God. The people, the religious leaders were annoyed that he was on the streets of the city preaching to poor people. So they put him in jail. Can you imagine? They don't want poor people to hear who Jesus is. Jesus is only for the rich and the popular and the famous. So they lock up John Bunyan because he knew that Jesus said, go out into the highways and byways, compel them to come in. Whosoever will may come. And they put him in jail. And they say as he was in jail, he go in the courtyard and start to preach to the other prisoners. And 
And I, he must have been an incredible preacher. Because the people would come from the village and stand outside the wall to hear him preach as he was in prison. And they got so annoyed that he was still preaching that they put him in solitary confinement. And since he, there was no one for him to preach to, he wrote Pilgrim Progress. I read Pilgrim Progress as a child. With the centuries later, at one point it was the most widely read and translated book other than the Bible. He wrote that while he was, sometimes it looked like he might have thought that God only wanted him to preach to the poor people in Bedford. But maybe God needed to sit him down so that he could write this book that would change people's lives for hundreds of years. They meant it for bad. Joseph told his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So his work change lives. He touched people. Ah, and that's what it's about. A lot of the times when people are doing us things, you know, because they unfairly terminated my contract last year, Jude. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. They thought that that would be the end of what God was doing in this house, but God meant it for good. He's taking us someplace. It doesn't matter what what the naysayers say in the name of Jesus we're going forward nobody has said to us that we need to turn around until God says stop we're moving on in the name of Jesus we've come this far by faith and we're still leaning on the Lord we're still trusted in his holy name he never failed and he ain't going to start with us he here and now we got a purpose God got a plan we're going somewhere in the name of Jesus and he said because of what has happened to me as I see that Paul wasn't down Paul wasn't saying after all I did for God this is what happened to me I'm here in jail and nothing he was praising God he didn't say I'm a prisoner of Rome he said I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ he's the one who has me here and he does all things well he that has begun a good work is well able to finish it and he said as people saw him praising still worshiping still living for God they too started to live for God that's what Peter said come Count it all joy. It doesn't matter what comes away. We cannot live afraid of what may happen. It doesn't matter what comes. God is doing a great work. No matter what, he has promised that he won't leave us. It is better to suffer with Jesus now so that we can live and reign with him when the time comes. We got to live all out for God. Like I said, sometimes God calms the storm. Sometimes he delivers us in the midst of the storm. They didn't just lock up Bunyan for a week or a month when they took him off the streets of Bedford. For 13 years, they left him in prison because of the crime of preaching God's word to poor people. And it wasn't the devil. Uh, the people were drinking alcohol and not going to church to lock him up. It was the people, the bishops and the, uh, the people who were in authority in the church who locked up Bunyan. 13 years he was in jail. And they said to him, if we release you, do you promise to stop preaching to the poor? And he said, if you release me today, tomorrow I'm going to be back on the streets. I got to do what God tells me to do. I can't fear man. I got to worship God. And because of his belief and his commitment, John Wesley, who started the United Methodist Church that is still here 400 years later, said he wanted to be like Bunyan and live for God no matter what. 
They have passed a rule that John Wesley was not to preach in any church in England. We think that it comes easy. But 400, hundreds of years later, we're still celebrating the fact that Wesley meant to live for God. That's a personal prize. We have Martin Luther who started the Reformation and broke away from the Catholic Church. And he said he wanted to live for Jesus because Jan Hus, who started the Moravian Church, was burnt at the stake. And he said like him, he didn't care if he lost his life. He was going to speak out for Jesus. And that's why we have the, the reformation that changed the world. That, that said, we don't have to go to a priest to pray for us. We can read the Bible for ourselves. We can pray for ourselves. Nobody has to do that for us. We are all God's children. We've all been ca called, you know, um, to serve Jesus. And he said that some are preaching Jesus out of envy. You know, some are doing it out of love. He said, it doesn't matter who is preaching or why they're preaching. Because they think that if they do this some more, people are going to get more upset with me and, get, and punish me more. I said, it doesn't matter. As long as the gospel is preached. We sing as long as the gospel has to be preached. It must be preached. And that is how we are to be. It doesn't matter who's preaching. If we don't, it doesn't matter who have a lot of people who don't have a lot of people who have money or who don't. You know, we're not in competition with anybody. We're just grateful that the word is going going forth and it, we don't have any judgment to pass we're not supposed to say oh this person ain't good enough to preach God's word look we're not that's not our job and that's not our calling the bible says that his word will not return to him void as long as the word goes out it goes out with the anointing of Jesus and it will touch out who touch lives and we are uh, support the true gospel we're not uh, supporting people preaching nonsense you know i'm totally don't care about people saying oh you have to look after the bishop apostle whatever and first lady i have never read that in the bible and i am not interested so we do it to the least of the brethren do to people really in need. I cannot understand and I will always speak out against it. How you could be living in a six million dollar home and no people are suffering. You could do, you know, um, as, as um, Rudy Giuliani is, you know, is going to trouble and I was laughing my head off because they said he should sell his condo. I think his condo is worth like 27 million. And he said, he can't sell it because he would be homeless. And they're like, you could live on a, a lot less than a $27 million house, Gondo, if you understand. So this is a mentality that we do not supposed to have in the church. You know, we are supposed to know that we can share with others. <clears throat> and Paul says that he's sure that he will be, live, be delivered you know, because other people are praying with him. You know, this Christian religion is not a lone ranger religion. Anybody you see who want to do everything by themselves and it's all about them, they're not walking with God. Only the devil, he got kicked out of heaven because he wanted it to be all about him. He was, God created Satan and he wanted to take over. And even when he met his maker here, Jesus, he said, oh, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all of this. That's how arrogant he is. That's how, look, if, Jesus, if he did not respect Jesus, who he knew said, let there be and there was, imagine how he feel about us. We got to be so careful because it's so easy to be caught up in going after Things that don't really matter. Because the things, we came in with nothing. And we're going out with nothing. Nothing is going, it doesn't matter who has more than us. Everybody's going six feet under. And everything is going to rot. You know, this is only temporary. Eternity is what matters. And so Paul is reaching out and he's saying, you're praying for me. And his Bible says, prayer is like when this, 
The woman kept coming before the unjust king. And he said, finally, I can't take this anymore. Every time I look around, she hear with the same complaint. Please give her so I don't have to see her anymore. The Bible never says that the first time we pray, oh, we could say, oh, God must look after it. Sometimes as we pray for things, we change our prayer. I'm so grateful that God didn't answer a lot of my prayers. Up to today, I would say, Lord, I thank you for delivering me from that. You know, I thought that it was the best thing. Thank you for not letting it work out. I appreciate you so much, Lord, for removing that from my life. And Paul was humble. Paul was a man who had raised the dead. He had healed the sick. He had cast out demons, started so many churches, but he was still saying, I know because you're praying with me, I will be delivered. Humility is a sign of greatness in God's kingdom. You know, the Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. The man who stretched out his rod and the Red Sea parted. You know, everybody I've noticed that the people are so arrogant, normally haven't done anything. They're just full of themselves because they think they're so wonderful. You know, it's not true. It's not true. If when you really come to know God, you know, the Bible says that if God doesn't build the city, the builder is building in vain. If God doesn't watch, the watchman is watching in vain. It's not our efforts that matter. It's God behind it. We have to stop complimenting ourselves and congratulating ourselves on how brilliant we are and how good we are. And we have to learn to say, had it not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be today? You know, had it not been for the Lord on my side, would I be alive today? Had it not been for the Lord on my side, would I be in my right mind today? Had it not been for the Lord on my side, where would my children be? Where would our family be? Is he had it not been for God? And that's Paul is saying, prayer, I need prayer. We all need prayer. Make a way, God. Do a change. Make a change. Do something for us, God. We are prayed for you. Break chains. Oh, Lord. Make the desert to bloom. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Because you are truly God. Jehovah. Jireh is our provider. Jehovah Rapha is our healer. God is taking us in places that we couldn't even imagine. And he's saying that he's not going to be ashamed. He just wants to have courage so that God will be exalted in his body, whether by life or by death. And he's saying this because he's about to appear before Nero. And Nero, he has appealed to Nero. It was a courageous thing to do. But Nero could have just said, you, you're annoying me, kill him. And he would have been killed on the spot. And he was saying that it doesn't matter. He had testified everywhere he went. He testified to Agrippa. Agrippa said, oh, almost as thou persuade me. King Agrippa. He testified to Felix, the governor. And Felix said, come back again when it's convenient. And it's never convenient. Now is the appointed time. Now is the day of salvation. And Paul is saying, I don't want to be afraid when I come before Nero and keep my mouth shut because he's so important. We must not go along with evil. We mustn't steal. We mustn't lie just to keep a job. We have to be able to say, God is going to provide. I got to hold on to my faith. It's more important to live for Jesus than to be friends with all the with the, whoever it is that think they're so important. And history records that Nero, before Paul appeared to him, was an okay emperor. And then we know and we believe that Paul testified of Jesus. And this first time, 
Nero let him go. But they say after that, it was like Nero was demon possessed. He had his servants hunt for Christians and he would cover them with tar and set them on fire in his garden. And he would ride through naked in his chariot to watch the Christians burn. Nero is one of the few emperors we know. Can we say, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. When Rome was burning flat, he was just playing songs to himself and doing nothing. And when he realized he would get in trouble, he said, it's the Christians. They're serving a false god. So that god, is our gods are punishing us. And he went throughout the world and he picked up Paul in Ephesus, brought him back to Rome, brought Peter back to Rome as well. And he beheaded Paul and Peter he crucified. That's how after he was given the opportunity by Paul to come to know Jesus. You see, the devil don't take any chance. He makes sure he took him over and turned him into this evil, crazy man. And Paul was praying. He didn't care that he would live for Jesus. It doesn't matter who is influencing us. You know, we got a new name, influencers on YouTube. We got a, a people, as, as Kirk Franklin said, we don't have, we have idols. You know, people who's singing and whatever. And we have got to be able to say, I'm going to live for Jesus. I might not be popular. No one might know my name. I might not have the big position, but I'm living for him. I'm telling others about him. Because when my reward comes, when that day comes, I want to hear him say, well done. Well done, oh good and faithful servant. They're working for a crown. We're going to a city that has foundation, whose builder and ruler is God. And Paul is saying he would like to go. You know, it's easier to die than to live for Christ. But, you know, he says it doesn't matter what the cause. It's all about Jesus. You know, and everybody has something that they're living for. People are into money. They want business people. I want to get rich. Uh, to the people who are in academics, it might be, oh, I want to be brilliant. The soldier might say, I want to win this battle. And, you know, people say, I want to be important. I want to be known. I want them, you know, they say you're famous when people know you by your first name only. I only have to say Beyonce and everybody knows who it is. Serena, everybody knows who it is. Madonna, everybody knows. That's how you know you've made it. When you only need one name. And everybody, you have to say novella spring it that they still ain't gonna know who I am. <laughs> you know. But that's what most people are living for. But Paul is saying, it's not about wealth. It's not about knowledge. He said, I've had all of this. And I count it all as dung. As nothing for me to live is Christ. I want to know him. I want to know him. In, you know, in the power of his resurrection. And in the fellowship of his suffering. Paul said, no, I just don't just want the good parts. I want the bad parts as well. Because I want to be like him. And he suffered. And he had power. And Paul lived it all true. He was left for dead outside Lystra and he had to run for his life. He was shipwrecked. He was in prison. He was beaten down. But everywhere he sent, he said, I know a man whose name is Jesus who can change everything for you. I can know real love. I know real joy. Walk with me and I'll show you this Jesus. He he didn't shut up. He didn't stop. And that is why 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. We're still saying, look what, the letters he wrote, he didn't know they would change the world. They have changed the world. Billions of people have read what Paul has written. And he said to die is gain. You know, he says, 
I'm, go, I'm, I'm willing to go and be with God. And the Greek word he uses when, like, when the military pack up and they move out. You know, we're done with this. We've finished. We've conquered. And we're moving on. He said, I'm willing to leave. But to die is gain. You know, I've made the investment. I've really lived for Jesus. And to die is gain. I'm, if I go, when I go, I'm going to get a crown of righteousness. I'm going to meet my family. We're going to meet so many of those who have gone on. You know, we're going to meet, oh, I'm going to, by God's grace, I'm going to meet my grandmother. I can still hear her. She died in 1888. But the sound, every morning she would wake up and she would pray aloud. I can still hear her voice filling the house as she prayed for all of us to live for him. And that's what it is to die is gain. I'm going to know Jesus. I'm going to get the crown of righteousness. Now he says, ah, it's not all of that. There's still a lot of work to be done. You know, I remember my old pastor saying that a lot of people want to die because they just want to make it to heaven. But there's so many people who don't know who Jesus is. So many people that we can witness to. So many things that we can do. Oh, I pray that God will open doors for all of us so that we may do even more for God. I know that what we're doing matters because Satan is trying to shut us down, trying to prevent us from preaching the word. But we're going to keep living. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep preaching because that's what God God wants us to do. Every member is a minister. All of us are called to do God's will, to do God's work in Jesus' name. You know, and in summary, Paul was writing this, writing these beautiful words. As his hand is chained to a prison guard, you might think that he was uh, living in a mansion, not sure how he's going to eat, not sure because somebody got to send him money for food, somebody got to send him money to pay the rent, not sure how he's going to make it, and he's still saying, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to give God the best of my life because he has done so much for me. Had it not been for the Lord, where would we be? He's given us beauty for ashes. He's done a great work in our life. And so Paul is here. And we are all here saying, I want to give you everything, God. It matters not what the circumstances. I'm going to praise the Lord while I have a chance. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to worship. I'm going to live for him. On the job, at home, at school. I just got to come to know who Jesus is. Because that's all that matters. Only what's done for Christ is going to last. Only living for Christ is going to work. Everything else is going to disappear. It's going to go into the ashes. You know, Rome is gone. I've been to Italy. It's all ruins. That great empire is just stone and sand and nothing much left. I must say, though, we always laugh about it. The Romans invented cement. And the roads that they built still look better than the roads we have today with all the holes in it. Their roads, nothing wrong with them. Their roads have outlived them. And we are still using cement today. No one has invented anything that can replace cement. <laughs> you know, the Romans did that. But they're gone. Pharaoh is gone. The pyramids are still there, but they're all gone. Alexander the Great is gone. All these great um, empires have come and gone, but Jesus is still here, still touching our lives, still looking after our families, still protecting us. 
still keeping our children, our grandchildren, our sisters, our brothers, you know, still keeping them safe and still giving us joy in the midst of the situation. We can still sing, I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. We don't feel no way he's tired. You know, I'm going to praise. We're going to dance. I would know he didn't bring us this far. He didn't get us here to leave us. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like. We give God the praise. We worship him and we praise him. Ah, I'm thankful for those of you who are here. I'm thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is so real. Ah, there's nothing like the presence of the Holy Ghost. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father and God, thank you for your work. Thank you for the support. Thank you for these adults who are so committed to excellence and who worship so totally and completely. Thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you, dear God, because you're more than enough. Ah, you keep providing. You keep blessing. Oh, Lord, may your word touch lives. May it change lives. May people come to know you more. Help us to grow in you even more, God, that we'll be more like you, become disciples of you. In your name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thanks for joining. Do have a blessed week.